Hi. Uh, today, I want to talk about the role of users uh, in the innovation process. This refers to uh, the activity of, of people who use products uh, in terms of modifying existing products to suit their purposes uh, or developing new products to uh, do things that they're interested in doing that existing products don't do. Uh, and the role of users as a participant, as an active participant in this process, uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, it's well documented uh, in this book by Eric von Hippel from MIT, uh, Democratizing Innovation. And Hippel makes the point very strongly that manufacturers would be well advised to um, both encourage and support users in this activity and probably to focus more on that as part of their innovation process uh, rather than letting their own R&D labs loose with their own imaginations. So observing and, and following what users do um, and particularly what Hippel calls lead users, people who are uh, experts and significant um, users of particular products and, and activities. Following those people um, gives many insights into the kind of things that, um, uh, that product design, product designers should be doing. Hippel gives a number of examples of, of users who uh, habitually develop and modify products. He looked very broadly at the kind of things that go on uh, in the world. Some of these, these user groups are uh, not a surprise in this list, CAD software users uh, and some librarians maybe, but some of them are also uh, unexpected. Uh, surgeons, uh, people interested in extreme sports, uh, mountain bikers, they're um, amongst the biggest groups of, of people who uh, have been very active uh, in developing new and existing products. One of the things that comes from the work of, of IDO, the design consultancy, is that when you're looking for insights that come from users, uh, it's actually more useful to look at the extremes of, of users. This is, a, this is a graph that shows um, uh, novice or amateur users on the, on the left-hand side, um, serious or professional users on the right. Most people, uh, average users, end up in the middle of this, of this bell curve. But you actually find more interesting things from looking at people who are either unfamiliar with a particular product or category or are very familiar with a product or category. That's more useful than looking at average users. The role of users in the, in the product development process is something that, um, uh, that Hippel looks at in terms of how lead users actually start off the business of, of new product development and are very active at the beginning. So initially, in, in a new product category, it's probably only uh, products available from lead user modifications that actually exist. Then as the category builds, then more people get involved. There are a number of users uh, increases, the number of consumers and participants goes up and so on. And then through the normal kind of product life cycle, uh, it starts to fall off over time as that particular product starts to uh, lose its significance. Looking at the kind of things that people do, uh, surgeons are particularly active uh, in developing uh, new or existing uh, products to suit their particular practice. Um, it's, it's really become something that, um, that most surgeons are involved in in some respects, largely maybe because of frustration with the uh, things supplied by existing manufacturers or a curiosity in, in actually doing things more effectively in developing their surgical practice. So IDO worked with a group of surgeons to uh, kind of accelerate and facilitate this process by looking at um, the kind of things that they would do in terms of tissue manipulation. This is a device that, that sucks tissue from a, uh, from a surgical site and sucks it away so that it's out of the way. And this was traditionally done by something that, that worked effectively, but was very inconvenient to use. So IDO worked with a, this group of surgeons to uh, using very simple prototypes made from clothes pegs and film cans and markers to uh, develop the shape of, of, of a device which would work more effectively and, and suited their practice. Another group in Hippel's list are mountain bikers. In fact, the whole sport of mountain bike, the whole activity of mountain bike design was really created by amateurs, participants, people who went to the hills above Marin County in, in San Francisco with clunker bikes and just hauled them up there on a truck and rode them down as fast as they could and then developed all sorts of devices and 
and components and frames and systems and suspension systems and so on that enable them to go up and down uh, more and more uh, rigorous and demanding slopes. And although it was something that the, the mainstream bicycle companies weren't at all interested in or weren't involved in at the beginning, it's now responsible for the creation of, of companies that have become uh, mainstream bike companies. And if you look at the whole world of extreme sports, uh, it's full of examples of people doing uh, ever more elaborate things to uh, get themselves excited, um, kind of get adrenaline pumping, find new and novel ways to jump off mountains, go across the sea, do different things on a board, and so on. So windsurfing, uh, hydrofoil surfing, uh, are all uh, both things that have been developed as, as, as sports, uh, largely on the basis of um, uh, amateur activity, people who got together, published designs that were then made available to everybody, um, uh, manufactured in a completely different way, and in some cases starting significant companies on the basis of those activities. And people's degree of inventiveness never ceases to amaze me. I really don't know if this is real or whether it's Photoshop. But this is real. This is um, uh, one of the examples of the many extreme sports that have been developed in New Zealand, a country that seems obsessed with different ways of people getting up and down mountains and, and so on. This is a Zorb. This is a plastic sphere that you strap yourself in uh, and roll down a hill. You're kind of protected because it's inflatable and absorbs impact, uh, but the world does go round and round and you can roll down a hill extremely quickly. And the whole culture of, of, uh, of this activity is one of, of, of sharing and things which uh, are making um, devices and improvements and, and things available to other people in a, in a very much a kind of open source spirit. This really derives from the early days of the, of the computer revolution, activities of hackers uh, in MIT and Stanford and so on, uh, essentially in an academic framework rather than industrial framework, uh, developing things, sharing them with others, learning from everybody's experience and so on. And the business about freely disclosing innovations is something that Hipple spends a considerable amount of time on. It's something which is very important to uh, the way in which these kind of innovations and, and changes, new products and so on, develop. It's not limited by patents. It's not limited by uh, non-disclosure agreements. And it can enable you to do things that mainstream companies will say are not possible. Uh, this is uh, Jonathan Goodwin, a mechanic who's based in, in Wichita, Kansas, uh, who reckons he can get 100 miles to the gallon from a Hummer. And General Motors don't believe that's possible. One example of a company that arose from these kind of enthusiast innovation routes uh, is Patagonia. Patagonia, the outdoor equipment company based in Ventura, California, is founded by Yvonne Chionard. Uh, Yvonne Chionard was a mountaineer, a uh, kind of dirtbag rock climber, uh, who found, he found it was frustrating to use the kind of equipment that was available for his sport at the time. So essentially, he set up a blacksmith shop. He learned blacksmithing and started to make pitons, which work more effectively for uh, getting up ice and, and rock uh, faces than the devices which already existed. And one of the points about this kind of enthusiast activity is that there is a little bit of a difference between uh, somebody who can create one thing in response to a problem or a need uh, and somebody who can translate that into the production of many. And Chionard and, and his colleagues in the company were one, one group who could do that. They still have very strong outdoor routes. They still relate to uh, particular kind of extreme sports and the excitement and romance of those activities. Uh, but they're also increasingly involved in, in recycling. They're re reusing recycled material and setting up systems for recycling uh, used clothing. And now with Patagonia Footprints, you can track the, uh, the journey of all the um, materials and processes involved in the production of any particular item. You can have a look at its carbon impact. You can look at its CO2 impact. And this is a kind of connection with their customers that is very important for the kind of outdoor enthusiast world that Patagonia operate in.